Thank you guys for being here today. I feel like I, so I, I see so many familiar faces. It just makes me happy and a little bit more comfortable speaking in front of, because this is the biggest group I've ever spoken in front of, <laughs> I think, except for my classes at UNA, and they don't really count. So, um, but yeah, thank you so much for asking me to do this, Lee. Um, I know you were <laughs> looking to fill a spot, but it really, it really does mean a lot. But you know, it just, it really does mean a lot. So I appreciate everybody for, for doing this. Again, thank you. Um, thank you. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about Arcadia Publishing. And I, um, I have fellow authors among us who have worked with Arcadia Publishing before. Um, but this is a company that, that really focuses on local histories and, and unique stories of areas. They, there are actually 257 books about the state of Alabama in their collection and their various imprints. And 101 of those are in the Images of America series, which is the, the book that, um, that my, the series that my book is in. Um, 101 of those, but yet <laughs> there is a Tuscumbia, there is a Muscle Shoals, there is a Florence, there is a Tennessee River in Northwest Alabama. Now there is a Lauderdale County, yet there is no Colbert County, there is no Sheffield. So... Anybody who wants to take that on, I'm sure that one of us can, can get you in touch with the right person, though. So, but the book, honestly, these are, they're unique when I say, well, I don't like to say that I wrote a book because it's mostly pictures, which I love that part. But, you know, we, uh, the authors do a lot of research to be able to accurately um, describe those pictures. So, you know, I don't, I don't like to take credit for stuff like that, but... It's, this book would not have been possible without the help of so many people in the community. It was not easy trying to gather pictures from people. Um, we put the call out. Jordan and Lee helped me put the word out and say, you know, I'm, I'm working on this. People are familiar with this series. So I thought, you know, surely people will come. We did some history harvest events at the library, had a few people who came. Um, I ended up, um, you know, everybody's pictures who, who everyone who, came and met with me, I did end up using at least some of their pictures. Um, got a lot from the, um, the UNA library. Mr. McDonald's collection was huge, hugely um, important to this book, as well as um, you know, the pictures that were at the library. Um, it was just a, it was a great opportunity for me to be able to meet all these people whose names I knew, but I had never met personally. So I felt honored to be able to make that connection with people finally. And everyone was gracious and it was just a great experience. So again, I encourage you, if you are interested in pursuing something like this, go for it because the, the benefits outweigh any of the toil and labor of, of the work. It's all worth it. Um, so and it, I say sources and inspiration because um, as a member of and the historian of First United Methodist Church, uh, William McDonald was a member of our church. Now, when, I, when he was still active and, and was historian of the, of the city, um, I was just, uh, you know, a baby Methodist, not literally a baby, but that I, was, I was new to the Methodist faith, faith and new to that church. I never did make that introduction to him, which I regret because to me, he's a superstar. He is like one of these people like you don't really actually talk to because they're not real. And um, so I, I have almost all of his books and I drew a lot of inspiration and you'll see that as we go forward. I, I drew a lot of inspiration from Mr. McDonald and all the work that he had done ahead of me. And I think that's our role um, as historians is to continue that, not to just rely on their work, but continue recording that work and continue gathering those stories and recording them for the future generations. So why me? <laughs> why, uh, you know, am, am I qualified to do this? I, I am a writer by trade. That is, that's, you know, that's my job as um, a freelance writer. And they, I think Arcadia found me because um, I have the Lauderdale County genealogy website. And they tracked me down and said, would you be interested in this? I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, that would be the most amazing thing ever. But um, I really love Lauderdale County. I am a sixth-generation Lauderdale Countyan. I don't even know if that's a real word, but it is now. Um, on both sides of my family, on my mother's side, I have one line, and on my father's side, I have one line. Um, my maternal grandparents go back to the Threets of Threets Crossroads, Waldrop's Grays, Darby's, Shelby's, Casey's, and then on the da my dad's side, I have Stutz and Danley's, and I know a lot of people are probably related to me in this room. Um, 
my um, fifth great grandmother was a Lauderdale. She's related to the Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel James Lauderdale. So I feel like I just have strong, very strong ties and, and it's always been my home. Lauderdale has always been my home. Um, one thing that, that I was overjoyed to find during this experience is continuing to uncover my connection to the county. For example, in Mr. McDonald's collection at UNA, I came across this picture. This is the 1910, uh, it's a 1910 um, picture of Underwood School. And thank the gods <laughs> of genealogy. <laughs> um, but or, I know there's only one God, but you know what I mean, it's an expression. But um, they, someone recorded the names on the back. And guess what one of those names was? My grandmother. My grandmother was born in 1896. She is a, the standing on the, the row, uh, back row in, on the right. She's the furthest to the right. She, um, you know, she was, I, I didn't even know she had gone to Underwood School. So I was able to uncover these things for myself, and those to me were just bonuses for this experience. It was just incredible. So I wanted to read to you, and I hope that we didn't have so many te te you know, technical difficulties that I take too much of your time, but I wanted to read a little bit of the introduction because what I tried to do, obviously, Lauderdale County has such a rich history going back to well before 1818, and we cannot, there, there are no images of the Chickasaws and the Cherokees that I could include in the book, so I did want to go into that in the, in the introduction. But with this book, because there was a Florence book and there was a Tennessee River book, I wanted to focus on the communities of, of Lauderdale County, just the, the, the little you know, towns and, and areas that make up these, um, the county, because we're so much more than just downtown Florence. Um, so I want to read just an excerpt from the introduction, not this one that's on the screen. But um, in the meantime, the areas outside the city limits of Florence were flourishing. Settlements that began well before the county was established continue to grow as more and more people fall, flowed in along the Natchez Trace, which ran through western Lauderdale, and Andrew Jackson's Military Road, which entered the county near what is now Green Hill. Even more braved the rapids of the Tennessee River or forged their own paths to find a new home in Lauderdale County. Pioneer Richard Rapier arrived before 1818 to trade with the Chickasaws and operate a fleet of keelboats. Jonathan Bailey moved here around 1813, purchasing hundreds of acres on which he would build a famous health resort. Daniel White built a stagecoach inn east of Blue Water Creek in 1812 on a site previously by, occupied by Chief Doublehead. Samuel Savage settled in western Lauderdale County. Darby's, Polks, and Fowler's blouse their way, I can't talk today, I'm sorry about that, blaze their way through the forest in 1816 to settle near Clo Cloverdale. American Revolution veteran Samuel Burney came to the area now known as Rogersville as early as 1810. These men and their families, along with scores of others, founded communities across Lauderdale County. Each of these settlements, from Anderson to Wright's Crossroads, developed its own personality based on its founders and its geographical features. Wealthier individuals established farming plantations in central Lauderdale along the many tributaries of Cypress Creek. Others found that the creeks, such as those running through Lexington, were ideal sites for water-powered mills, and the mineral springs, like those on Jonathan Bailey's land, were conducive to health spas. The fertile land along the southern bend of the Tennessee River and south of Elgin proved perfect for growing cotton. Hiram Kennedy established a gun factory in Green Hill because its location along the military road provided the opportunity to sell weapons to travelers. More people came to Lauderdale from across the United States as well as abroad, bringing with them their diverse heritage, skills, ideas, traditions, and religion. They established schools for their children and churches for their families. They built inns for visitors and stores for settlers. They became farmers, merchants, teachers, preachers, mail carriers, mill workers, tradesmen, and homemakers. For decades, the county thrived as its inhabitants capitalized upon its great potential. And those are the kind of stories that, of those people that I wanted to capture in this book. So, starting with the cover, I've obviously mentioned Bailey Springs. It's very special to me because I live very close to Bailey Springs. I don't know, you know, that's how, how God wanted us to be. We ended up there, and I'm in such this, this rich, you know, um, place of rich history. Now, granted, it is a trailer park now, 
um, Bailey Springs is, uh, the site of Bailey Springs, there is a trailer park, but it doesn't mean that, that any of that history is, is lost. I would love to write another book about this, but this, cover, this picture ended up on the cover um, because it does give a really good uh, snapshot of what life was like back then. Virginia Ellis was actually um, part of the Ellis family that took over management of the um, Bailey Springs Health Resort after uh, Jonathan Bailey died. In the chapters, um, the way that, that I organized the chapters was based on the, the pictures that I was able to, um, to gather. So they actually kind of fell into place. I was able to steal a couple of lines from Mr. McDonald's book. I know you guys recognize Lore of the River as one of his books. Um, then Came the People is actually one of his um, chapter titles in, in his history of Lauderdale County. But then I also wanted to focus on, you know, the, the river, of course, um, the bridges, the railways, the, the roadways, what people did during the, that time. Um, all of the businesses, our churches, our schools, our home places, the, the plantations, and all of the, the beautiful, ar beautiful architecture, and then, of course, the people that made this place a home. So starting with um, my first chapter, which is the lore of the river, there's, you could go on, you could, there it actually is a book about the Tennessee River. It is such an integral part of Lauderdale County. It, it literally um, defines us. It defines our boundary, our southern and western boundary. Um, we can start really, I mean, we know the story about the, the, the treacherous waters of the shoals. Um, of, and, and how those were tamed. But really, our history about trying to tame, of taming that water started with the Muscle Shoals Canal. This is a picture that I was able to um, scan, and um, it's not from Mr. Pettis's collection, but Ronald Pettis, I cannot tell you how much that man knows <laughs> and how much he's probably forgotten more than I will ever know, but he has an amazing collection of, of images and a lot of the canal. But this one I chose to share with you today because I thought it was interesting. At the, um, the mouth of the Shoal Creek, there was such a great volume of water flowing from Shoal Creek that they had to build an aqueduct. And this is the aqueduct. It was 20 feet above the canal. Um, it was supported, they, they called it a feat of engineering because it was supported by two abutments and 25 masonry piers. But people loved to look at it because it looked like these ships were flying from above just because of the elevation. And so I, I cannot imagine being back there and seeing something like this, but I just love, love these stories. Um, the second chapter is really about, like I said, you know, getting around Lauderdale County. We are, um, we, it's, we're, we're a, a county of bridges. We are, when we talk about the bridges, of course, the railroad bridge comes to mind. And I have several pictures of the railroad bridge in the book. Um, there was, of course, O'Neill Bridge and the harbor there. Um, but Shoal Creek Bridge, I found an, uh, it interesting. This one took a little bit of digging because digging through the newspaper accounts of the bridge. I didn't know this until I started doing this research, but Shoal Creek Bridge was originally built as a wooden bridge in 1881, and it was blown away, not blown, but uh, it flooded. <laughs> Flood waters took care of a lot of our bridges back in the day. Um, even any account that you read in the newspaper, it's like they're replacing this bridge because it was taken by floodwaters. They're replacing that bridge, and bridges were almost like a you know, they were replaceable. They, they were not meant to be a long-term um, investment. Um, Shoal Creek Bridge, though, started as a three-truss lumber bridge as early as 1881. I couldn't find exactly when that was built, but they were replacing lumber in 1881. They repaired it. It was washed away in 1890, and they repaired it. Um, it was washed away again in 1899, and they repaired it. Finally, in 1924, it was inundated with floodwaters and completely dismantled as they were building a new bridge, which is the five-truss, two-lane steel and concrete bridge that opened in November 24, of, I mean, of November of 1924. Believe it or not, almost 100 years ago. That is the bridge that's still there. Um, this, a second bridge was built at Shoal Creek in 1950 because Lee Highway was then a four-lane highway. 
so they had to build another two-lane bridge to accommodate that traffic. The 1950 structure is the one that was removed in 2007 when they built the large thing that we have now. Um, but just this evolution of Shoal Creek was just fascinating to me, just because we never think of bridges as going away. Um, these days, they're, they're always there. And this one was built 100 feet, um, or um, I don't think it was 100 feet. It was built high enough to where it was not in uh, you know, any danger of being flooded. You may recognize this, Lee. This is Lee's family, fun on the farm. But I wanted to do a chapter about what kept us busy. What, what did people do for fun? Um, what have we always, because I remember my mother talking about when she was young, she would, you know, they would play with marbles. They would play with sticks. They would play with mud pies. Um, and, you know, there was always something. We didn't always have TikTok and, um, you know, video games. Um, people found ways to entertain themselves, whether that was fishing, which fishing, uh, it was, it's just a part of so many of our lives and so many of our histories. Um, Bailey Springs, of course, which was just an incredible place for people to come and, and spend time. Um, Camp Westmoreland, uh, it, I found a lot of pictures in the Library of Congress. Someone had come there in the 1950s and took a lot of, of really great images of the, the Boy Scouts there. Um, we had tourist camps. There's a tourist camp in my book in Killen on uh, the main highway called Shady Rest. And it's just, it, it's like a, um, you'll see the picture in the book though, but it's like a concrete pool, like literally concrete blocks and people are swimming in this pool. People just, they, they, they kept themselves busy. I found some pictures, um, actually um, one of the contributors had the pictures of a, a racetrack where the Lauderdale County dump is. Um, there, were, there were baseball fields and a pool called Crystal Plunge at the fairgrounds. Um, there were singing schools, now this is going a little bit further back from the fairgrounds, but that was a major attraction at one time as people would gather for singing schools and they would present you know, what they had learned. And then of course we had the, the organizations like the Elks Lodge and the Woodmen of the World and, and all of those things. We, we have always found as a people that you know, obviously the land lends itself to outdoor activities. We live in such a beautiful place, but people were able to be very enterprising and um, like the Freemans here, you know, they hopped in a wagon and just had fun. And there's an easily amused. A, easily amused. <laughs> um, there's another picture on the same page where they're standing on a, a gigantic hay bale. On a wagon. On a wagon. So yeah, they risk their lives for fun. <laughs> slow day on the farm, no. Um, but it's, I, I, I got a lot, lot of joy researching what people did. And of course, you know, we would not be where we are today. We would not be the people we are today without the people who did the work. And I don't mean just the farmers and the mill operators and the, you know, the people we had, I cannot tell you how many gins I found. <laughs> uh, we have lo had lots of gins and lots of mills. But we also had entrepreneurs like Mr. McCorkle here. He is actually um, my mother, other mother-in-law. I have my mother-in-law is here today, but my, I have another mother-in-law. It gets complicated, but anyway, this is her grandfather. He was blind, and he ran a, a grocery store. And he would walk to his store. He knew exactly how long, how many steps it took to get to his store. And he would walk there every day and open the store. And I asked her the question. I said, how did he not get ripped off? <laughs> you know, did people take advantage of him? She said, no, they didn't. They, it was a different time. People did not do that to him. And he was trustworthy. He trusted other people as well. And I just thought that was a beautiful story. Um, we have, there are pictures of all sorts of retail establishments. People would gather on the porches. Um, I like looking at these pictures that's so crisp and clear and seeing what they were selling at that time. I think that's, yeah, lemon cookies, that did look good. So, um, But it's such a big part of, of the daily life. I mean, all these things, when we think about them, we're not that different. We just have different, you know, different ways of doing things, but we're still working. We're still creating this heritage for our area. 
Churches obviously are a huge part of the South and, and extremely important here in, Lauder, or in Lauderdale County and Colbert County, obviously, but um, there, there is, I don't know that a count has ever been done of how many churches, how many faiths we've had in Lauderdale County because I don't even know where you'd start. Absolutely, absolutely. I think people are still shocked to find that we have a, um, a synagogue, you know, in, in Lauderdale County. Because, but we are such a faith-filled um, area. This is a picture of the Mallard Creek. Um, let's see, how do we say that? Primitive Baptist, and it is at Mount Moriah Primitive Baptist Church. Mount Moriah was established in 1896. It was moved from the fairgrounds to Irvin Avenue in West Florence. Um, one, my husband works for the Florence Fire Department, and when one of his friends saw this, he said, that's my church, and I did not even know that. He didn't know. That's, he goes, he's been going to that church all his life. He didn't know that they had relocated. So a, another reason that we do this kind of work, to keep that, that history and share it. Um, I do want to share another another really exciting thing for me. It was really, uh, you know, um, it was special to me. My mother has had dementia for about 15 years. And so every time I go visit her, it's a brand new thing, brand new day, you know, reintroducing myself to her. But I brought my book the other day and um, just showed her a couple of pictures. And I showed her a picture of St. Joseph Church, which was in, I think you're the one that had that in your collection. It was the original St. Joseph Church. And I showed it to her, and she said, that's St. Joseph. You know, I think that um, another, yet another reason that, that we need to preserve these things is because they are such a, an integral part of people's memories. And seeing these things can really, you know, help those memories blossom and, and help, those, um, help them bring back, you know, better times. Along with schools, hand in hand, I'm sorry, along with churches, Go schools, hand in hand. This is St. Florian School. Um, it was, I don't know what that gave that away, if it, you know, not, certainly not the priest standing there. But um, St. Florian School was established in 1873 after the, the um, when the first official, like, uh, designated priest arrived. And his niece was their first teacher. Classes were held in the church building, which I believe this is the, um, the church building. And until they actually erected the school across from the road, and then the brick building that is still there in St. Florian on Church Road um, was built in 1926. But they're just like the churches. I don't know that we could ever get an accurate list of all the schools that we had in Lauderdale County. Some were, were very small, some were very short-lived, um, but people have memories of their favorite teachers, the things that they learned, the way that they... Um, the way that they learned during the day, how, you know, it's, and, and those are the things that we all need to listen to and, and um, record. Homes. Now, um, you know, sometimes the word plantation is a, is a bad word um, in today's society, but to me, it's, I focus on the, the homes um, rather than what went on on that land, but this is a special one to me out of the, the chapter because it is um, the home of, well, actually the Hannah family built this back in the, well, I don't even know exactly when it was built in the 1800s, but the Hannah family is a pioneer family. That um, home was purchased by Andrew Jackson Hutchings, who is a nephew of Andrew Jackson, the president, his wife, Rachel. He was a ward of John Coffey. Um, later, it was owned by John Coffey's son, Alexander Donaldson Coffey. He was a Civil War captain. He um, died there in 1901, and the house burned not long after that. Coffey High School was named after Alexander Donaldson Coffey, and ECM was named after the hospital, was named after his daughter. So um, it's significant to me. John Coffey was, is somebody that I'm fascinated by, and I would love to do a lot more research on him. But... What I loved is that we, we have this picture of the foyer of this house, and it's just normal. <laughs> it's just like any other foyer. It's, you know, the old grandfather clocks there, the, the hat and, and cane stand, and, you know, the, you know, a little, what kind, is that a guitar? Is that a mandolin? Is that a, I don't know. But that, you know, it's just, it's so typical. It's so normal. 
these stories. I want to share these in their entirety. So our population is so diverse today, but as well as back then, we had such um, a, a great combination of people. And, you know, we, everybody has their own story. There was no way to include all the stories that, that I wanted to in this book. They're, they gave me a limit. I don't know why, but they gave me a limit of pictures that I could use. So today I want to talk to you about the, these two men that are on pages 120 and 121. And the picture on the left you've probably seen before um, because it's, it's pretty iconic in Lauderdale County. But this is Mr. Reuben Patterson. Um, he was also called Uncle Rube. He, he was enslaved. He accompanied um, Colonel Joseph, I'm sorry, Josiah Patterson of the 5th Alabama Cavalry um, to war, to the Civil War. While he was there, which that was not unusual at the time, they, you know, there were a lot of enslaved people who went to war. Um, while he was there, though, he was captured um, by the Union forces, and he was placed in charge of a Union colonel's horse. And one day he went missing, and so did the horse. And a couple of days later, he showed up at Patterson's camp with that Union <laughs> soldier's horse, and, um, you know, that, he could have left. He could have gone away. But um, he, he brought that Union horse to the Confederate camp. I just thought that was funny. <laughs> he actually, after the war, he went and worked at the Muscle Shoals Canal, another canal story, for, 50, for 25 years as a cook. And he wanted to go back to war in 1898 when a lot of men from Lauderdale were leaving to go to Cuba for the Spanish-American War, and they wouldn't let him, you know. I, I, I don't know why. I mean, he's, he's, he looks like he's ready to go right there. But um, in 1924, this picture was taken um, at the Confederate Soldier Reunion in Memphis. And with him is Colonel Josiah Patterson's granddaughter. So there was still a family connection there. Um, when Rube Patterson died in 1928 at age 95, the United Daughters of the Confederacy and the, and the Sons of Confederate Veterans actually all attended as many members as they could. They held great, held great reverence for Mr. Patterson. And one of the Josiah Patterson, the, you know, the, the family where he worked, uh, one of their descendants was the 30th governor of Tennessee. Your son, Malcolm. And he sent flowers. So and he has this illustrious past that we, we, need to, we need to know about. On the right is Kit Butler. Kit was also enslaved. Um, he was born into slavery in 1852 in Marengo County, Alabama. He moved with slave owner Martin Butler to a plantation in Mississippi. Um, he eventually ended up back here in, in um, Lauderdale County in Center Star. And in, in, in 1872, and while he was there, he would often recount stories. He could hear the cannons going off, and, and he remembered watching Union soldiers march by when he was in Mississippi. Um, he was actually freed um, with emancipation um, by Martin Butler, but he stayed to work there on the, on the farm until 1866. He died in 1961 in Center Star, just shy of his 110th birthday. So... Can you imagine the things that these guys saw? 1961. Some of us were around then. So that's pretty cool. I could talk the rest of the afternoon, but I know nobody wants that. But I do want to thank the, again, I thank you for having me today. But thank you, Tennessee Valley Historical Society, for all you've done. Um, everything that you have done, this is just one example. This is actually in my book. This is a, a map of some of the significant um, spots, homes and, and um, plantations and some businesses there um, that I just I thought it was wonderful because those, most of those places are gone. And what um, Phil has kind of stole my, my idea, but I, what I wanted to say with this slide is that one of the, the best ways that we could honor Chris and everything she did is to really work hard to get that archive done. And if anybody can do it, it's our group. It's our group, our family of genealogists, of family historians, of public historians. We're the ones that care about it, and we're the only ones that can make it happen because a politician is not going to, don't mean to get on a soapbox, but they're not just going to volunteer to give money to something like this. 
um, we're going to have to do work. And Phyllis, I'll do whatever I can to help you. Again, thank you, Lee. Thank you, everybody, for giving me this time today. <laughs>